in all of Swan Global's 23 years of specialising in executive search, at board level with C-suite executives and with technical roles in the natural resources and engineering sectors, we have come across many remarkable companies and remarkable people. With our offices in the UK, North and South America, Asia and here in Australia, and meeting those many remarkable people, moving them from small companies to big companies and vice versa, we've been able to introduce many new capabilities to a widespread of clients. The companies and the people are often operating in very difficult circumstances. One of the big ones is Rio Tinto. And the company earlier this year took a big decision to appoint a new chief executive, John Sebastian Jacques. JS, as he's otherwise known, has a truly remarkable background. After completing his university degree in France, he moved to Indonesia to work in manufacturing for the cosmetics giant L'Oreal. Then it was back to Europe to make pipes and tools for the oil and gas sector. Quite a change. Then there was aluminium and steel making, finishing up as group strategy manager at Tata Steel. And in 2011, a move to Rio Tinto. After less than five years, he has become chief executive at 44. It has tr been a truly meteoric rise for this man. Prior to his latest role at Rio, he was in charge of the company's copper interests. The big copper play being Oyu Tolgoi in Mongolia, which has required long and drawn out negotiating with the Mongolian government. And now we will see a big mind at work on big matters across the big Rio Tinto. We can expect further strengthening of so many aspects of Rio Tinto's activities. And I see the investment community is confident about the future for Rio Tinto and its shareholders under JS. After attending the last two AFL grand finals at the MCG and under Chris Lynch's good coaching on rugby and AFL, now we see JS at Etihad Stadium for his debut visit. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome JS. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to recognize the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundji people of the Kuling Nation, and offer my respect to their elders, both past and present. I would like to note Sir Avi Pabo, Lee Clifford, and Martin Ferguson, who are all in this room, for their contribution to our, to our industry. All of you are giants in our sector. And Lee, I'm not just saying that so I can get a seat on one of your planes tonight when I have to go back to Sydney. Um, it's great to be here with you today um, to share some thoughts on our industry and the important role Australia will play in keeping it strong and relevant in the decades to come. There is no doubt we live in a rapidly changing world. Economies are shifting, our environment is changing, politics is more fragmented, and technology is transforming the rules of the game. Our industry has a key role to play in meeting some of the world's challenges and in turn to position ourselves as part of the solution and not part of the problem. Even so, as an industry, we do face some challenges. And we must challenge ourselves to look for innovative solutions to old industry problems on things like safety, the environment, and last but not least, well, diversity and inclusion, and last but not least, explaining how we contribute to modern life. This will require a reset in our thinking 
our behaviors, and many, many of our long-held assumptions. I believe that Australia has a vital role to play. I would go as far as saying that Australia should raise its ambition, as it has a unique opportunity to become the epicenter of the global mining industry. But more on this later on. As mentioned, the last time I was in Melbourne was with Chris Lynch at the AFL Grand Final. I'm not going to say too much about it today. However, something very important I've been told. All you need to know that I was not wearing a red and white scarf. <laughs> I've been told that that should hopefully guarantee me safe exit from this building. <laughs> we'll see if it happens. And even a seat to go back to <laughs> Sydney tonight, depending, on, of course, on what I have to say next. On a, on a more serious note, in preparation for today, I read the first MMT speech given by our patron, Sir Harvey Pabo, 15 years ago. Many of the themes covered them still apply. I, noted, I did note his views that the industry, his quote, has not been good at explaining itself to the public. And then his comments were, when it, comes, when it comes to public policy, what does not make sense often has an excellent chance of occurring. It's fair to say that it's good to see that some things never change. Let's be clear, now is not the forum to talk about silly policy positions. You can ask the question at the end if you want. But it strikes me that 15, 15 years on, the industry has not found a way to fully connect with the society. Actually, I think this is probably true for most big businesses. I see in Australia and also in the US, Canada, in the UK, that business is not always painted in the most positive light. The jobs we create, the tax we pay, or the billions we invest are being missed in the discussion. For the mining sector, we have an opportunity to tell our story in a new way, to reinvent, reinvent ourselves, to attract the next generation of talented youngsters. I think it's on table 46 from memory. We must, we must stop the short thinking, short term thinking. We need to look 10 years ahead and consistently deliver value through all cycles. Our, our aim must be to make a material difference to our communities and the world more broadly. With this in mind, I'm going to argue today that mining is one of the most vital industries on the planet. Now, of course, I'm speaking before a supportive audience, and I would expect some backing here. I feel much better now. Um, but, but let's be clear, I mean, on, on a serious note here is, but you wouldn't get a lot of support for, for this idea if you spoke to the people on the street. And I think it is a real shame. So what is more important than, than mining? I mean, if you were to ask the general public, most people would choose self-driving cars, solar energy, and if you were my daughters, my teenage daughters, smartphone technology, their best friend, something like that. But the fact is, none of those options would be possible without mining. Therefore, if mining is one of the world's most important industries, it is no accident that Australia is at the heart at the both past and future. It is a nation with absolutely beautiful minerals and energy resources, but also a population of smart, innovative people a large proportion of which have mining in their blood and represent the pioneering spirit and grit that is so much part of our industry. At Rio, Rio Tinto, we can find Aussies all across our business and it's not uncommon to see Vegemite in our offices from Africa to Mongolia to London or to Canada. Australians are great advocates for the industry and for Australia. So how can Australia make more and not less 
of its world beating mining heritage, from excellence in operations and talent to industry leading technology and mining financial expertise. How can Australia position itself as the backbone of the global mining industry? I fundamentally believe Australia has a unique opportunity we should not waste. As the world becomes more protectionist, country, countries look to shut their borders and turn inwards. Australia could buck the trend. Open its door, open its heart to the mining industry of the future. I believe there are three key areas where Australia could make the most of its obvious strength. The first one, it's positioning itself as the financial center for mining. The financial center for mining. The opportunity there is for Australia to get ground on London and beat Vancouver as the place the industry wants to put its dollars and its best people. The, the uncertainty of Brexit in the UK and the recent election of Donald Trump in the US makes now a perfect time for Australia to grab the initiative. As an example, Australia could form alliances and partnerships with financial markets in Singapore and Hong Kong. But if Australia wants to do this, it must become more attractive as an investment destination for the business, which means stable policy, more competitive tax settings, an incentive for companies to set up shop and stay. The simple truth is that Australia remains one of the most expensive places for us to do business. Take the corporate tax, for example. I'm sure everybody in the room, well, I hope so, knows the corporate tax here is around 30%, one of the highest in the developed world. Prime Minister May in the UK is talking about cutting the UK corporate tax rate to a record low of 15% or below. And of course, not to be outtrumped 